So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tanmay Bakshi and today we're going to be going over how you can use the brand new Swift for TensorFlow library to train your own neural networks entirely within the Swift programming environment. Now before we even get into what we're going to build today, let's start off by talking a little bit more about the key phrase that you probably heard first. Swift for TensorFlow. Now, again, before we get to Swift for TensorFlow, let's talk a little bit more about TensorFlow itself. Now, I'm sure that if you've been watching my videos for some time now, you've interacted with TensorFlow in some way. In fact, the majority of my deep learning based videos use Keras, which is a deep learning library built around TensorFlow, CNTK, and Tiano. Now, TensorFlow is the most mature of these backends that go behind Keras, which is why almost always I end up using TensorFlow. Now, something to note about TensorFlow, though, is that when you're using Keras, you are using a very high-level abstraction of the TensorFlow core. And so essentially, you've got TensorFlow operations defined in C, then you've got a wrapper around them in Python for TensorFlow, and then you've got Keras as another wrapper around that, a very high-level neural network wrapper, enabling you to develop neural networks very quickly and prototype different architectures. Now, if you've been working with Keras, you'll probably find it a great experience because of how easy it is to create your neural networks, custom layers, custom loss functions, whatever else it is that you may need. But TensorFlow, when you start to work with raw TensorFlow code, well, you'd eventually find one thing that the TensorFlow community has found as an issue of TensorFlow for a very long time now. The problem is that it's not intuitive. What do I mean by not intuitive? What I mean is that TensorFlow is very limited by the Python programming language itself. You see, tensor operations are defined in C. If you want to create your own tensor operations, well, you've got to write C code. And then from there, let's just say you want to build a neural network with raw TensorFlow. Then you've got to define a graph, you've got to add your tensor operations to that graph, and then you've got to execute the graph. It's not intuitive and it doesn't work easily. It's difficult for programmers and it's not very maintainable code that you're able to write, which is why the majority of developers prefer PyTorch or Torch, even though Torch is written in a different language altogether, Lua. But now the TensorFlow team wants to change that because they know TensorFlow has a few unique points that separate it from the majority of all other deep learning libraries. Like, for example, support for Google's proprietary Tensor Processing Unit that enables you to train neural networks hundreds of times faster than you could with graphics processing units alone. And so this is why they are rewriting TensorFlow and the wrapper around it to work on a compiled programming language. And which language would be better for the task than the Swift programming language? Now, why is Swift such a good fit? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, of course, the fact that it's open source, the fact that it's cross-platform, the fact that it has over a million active developers, and the fact that it's the world's fastest growing programming language. But apart from that, there's the fact that Chris Latner, the lead developer of the Swift programming language, actually went from Apple to Tesla to lead their autopilot division a little while ago. And then he went from Tesla to Google, leading the TensorFlow acceleration teams. Now, after he started to lead the TensorFlow acceleration teams, is around when TensorFlow thought, hey, what if we were to rewrite TensorFlow in a compiled language to make it easier for everyone to write TensorFlow code? And so Chris Latner was put in charge of the project and they're now doing it with Swift. But wait, just one moment. Why is it called Swift for TensorFlow and not TensorFlow for Swift? Well, they're rewriting TensorFlow in the Swift language instead of Python, right? Well, not exactly. In fact, the TensorFlow team believes that machine learning is such an important technology for the future that, well, they believe that it deserves first-class compiler support, which is why they are actually integrating TensorFlow into the actual Swift compiler. In fact, you can take a look at all the changes they've made at the TensorFlow branch on the official Apple Swift repository on GitHub. Now, eventually, all these changes are going to be pushed into master, and you'll be able to use TensorFlow as just another framework that's built into the Swift standard library inside of your Xcode playgrounds, for example. And so this is the power of Swift for TensorFlow. It enables the Swift compiler itself to take a look at all of the tensor operations within your code and automatically take them all, construct a TensorFlow graph, and the best part, let's just say you want to run that graph on the GPU or the TPU. It's only one line of code. 
enable GPU or enable TPU. And just like that, the Swift compiler will take all your code and accelerate it on the GPU or accelerate it on the TPU. And it also supports amazing conveniences like automatic differentiation. So for example, let's just say you're writing a neural network in a, in a structure and you define the forward pass of your neural network. You tell the neural network that you're gonna run these convolution operations or this bilinear interpolation, whatever it is that you might wanna do. Now, right as you're done with that, you don't need to write your gradient function. You do not need to write the backward pass of your neural network because all you do is you tell Swift for TensorFlow that, there, that this function is a differentiable function and it'll automatically use the Swift compiler to take a look at all the tensor ops within that code and calculate that backward pass for you so you don't need to. And so again, that's just the power of the Swift for TensorFlow library. And again, just the plain and simple fact that Swift is compiled gives you another huge advantage over Python, which is of course that it can check for errors and let you know even before you run your code, so you don't need to figure out by the time your code actually gets to that line with the error in it. And of course, the team acknowledges that it will take a very long time, and of course, a lot of effort to bring people over from Python to Swift which is why they've built a Python Swift bridge to enable you to call Python code, like for example, NumPy or sklearn, directly within the Swift programming language, as if it were just another Swift package. All right, and so that's a quick primer on the Swift for TensorFlow library and how you can actually train neural networks in TensorFlow in the Swift environment. But now let's get into what you're gonna be building today. So today, I'm going to show you how you can build an application that uses convolutional neural networks implemented on Swift for TensorFlow accelerated on the GPU, specifically on Google Collaboratory, and also how you can compile Swift yourself on your own Ubuntu server in order to run your own code, accelerate this convolutional neural network on the GPU, train it to get over 97% accuracy on the MNIST database, and then how you can actually export those weights download it back to your computer, and then host a model using Python Flask in order to take new, new digits that a user draws on an iPad screen and run them through the Flask server to get a prediction and return it back to the user. All right, so now without any further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at how you can build this application. Let's get started. All right, but before we get to the code, let's take a look at a demo of the application in action. Now, if you've already seen my video on interpolating between MNIST digits, you've probably seen an interface just like this one before. But in case you haven't, no problem, let's take a quick recap. Now, this over here, this black square in the middle of the screen, is the draw view. Over here, as the name suggests, you can draw whatever you want to. You could draw a person's name, whatever you want to do. Uh, essentially, just lets you draw things on screen. Now, what's more interesting are the two buttons below the draw view. There's the predict button and there is the clear button. Clear button, very self-explanatory. You click it, clears whatever you drew on the draw view. But the predict button enables you to take whatever it is that you drew, convert it to an image, send that image over to a Flask server running the model that I trained using the same code you're about to see in just a moment, and then from there, tell me what it is that I drew along with a confidence value. So let's go ahead and draw a random digit, say, for example, the digit 7. Now, if I click on predict over here, it lets me know that indeed I did draw the number 7 and even gives me a confidence value, which is a 1. Multiply that by 100 to get a percentage and you get a 100% confidence. Now, of course, this is because it was actually so precise um, that I had to round up to, uh, to 100%. Now, if I click on OK, we can go back to drawing. Now, to show you how robust this neural network model is, I could draw the same 7 and 7 in a different style. So, for example, let's just say I were to add this little um, line over here, which is how some people were to draw a 7. Still tells me it's a 7. I could draw something a bit more complex, say a 4 really straight like this. There we go. It tells me that I did draw a 4. Or maybe I want to draw a 4 like this. And it still tells me, it still tells me that I drew a 4. 
We can do something more complex, like for example, nine is a number that models traditionally have a little bit of trouble working with, but I click on predict and indeed it tells me that I drew the number nine. One is also a very interesting number when it comes to neural networks, because if I click on predict, it tells me that it's a one, but I can draw a one in a few other ways as well, but it still tells me that I drew a one. Now, of course, this is actually a pretty accurate neural network model for something that was trained in under 10 minutes. In fact, this is at over 97.7% accuracy, and I'm going to show you how you can train your own version of this model in just a moment as well. As you can see, it says I drew a two, but now let's go ahead and take a look at how you can actually build this application and the model that goes behind it. So now let's take a look at how the code actually works behind this whole application. And let's start off with the actual unique part of this app. And that is, of course, Swift for TensorFlow. Now, over here, I've actually SSH'd into a server. However, if you do not have access to an Ubuntu or Mac OS laptop or computer, or you don't have access to an NVIDIA GPU-enabled computer to train the neural network, no worries at all, because you can use Google Collaboratory to train your neural networks instead. There will be a link in the description to Google Collaboratory and how you can set up your own Swift environment in just a few simple steps. But for now, let's take a look at how you can run this on an Ubuntu machine. Now over here, I've got a folder called MNIST. Inside of it, I've got three files, main.swift, mnist.npz, and w.npy. w.npy are the last trained weights that you actually saw in the demo just a moment ago. mnist.npz are the actual MNIST files uh, that have the MNIST dataset within them, and main.swift is the code that actually trains the neural network. Now to show you how this works from scratch, let's go ahead and remove the dataset. And let's also remove the weights. And then let's go into the code. Now, in the code over here, we start off with, of course, a fundamental line, import TensorFlow. And after that, over here, the second line of code is one of the most unique things about Swift for TensorFlow, right here in the top of the file. This is the enable GPU function. Just like that, TensorFlow has enabled CUDA acceleration, and we can now train the neural network model on GPU. That's all I need to do. None of the code that you see from here on out was written with the specific intent of running on a GPU. This could just as easily run on any other device. All right, let's continue. Now, as I mentioned, there is a Python Swift bridge, which is why I import Python. And then from there, I import three different Python packages. OS, the operating system to download data, NP for NumPy, and metrics, specifically sklearn, scikit-learn.metrics. This is used to calculate the accuracy score. From there, I go ahead and create an extension to the dataset type so I can actually load my MNIST dataset into Swift for TensorFlow, into the script. Now, there's act actually sort of adopted this dataset from one of the official Swift for TensorFlow examples, the SciFar example to, to be specific. There'll be a link to where you can get this extension down in the description below, but I've modified it slightly in order to make it so it actually takes one hot encoded labels instead of sparse encoded labels. From there, what I do is I check if the MNIST file, the actual data set, exists using a Python package. If it does not exist, then I go ahead and w get that data, and of course I go ahead and read the results so we can wait for it to be done before we actually continue. Now, once it's actually done downloading, then I go ahead and tell NumPy to load that file into the MNIST constant. Once that's been loaded, I go ahead and create four different constants, xtrain and xtest, and ytrain and ytest. Now, when it comes to Swift standards, you would probably want images training or training images or testing images and then training labels and testing labels. But the thing is just to make it a little bit clear and show you the sort of contrast between what you would usually write in Python and what we're writing in Swift, I decided to keep it with xtrain xtest and ytrain ytest, which is what you're all more familiar with. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at how this actually works. So what I do is I take xtrain from the MNIST dataset, and then I go ahead and convert that to a float32 type. I reshape it to 602828281 because, of course, we want images that are 28 in width, 28 in height, one channel only because it's grayscale. But then again, all of these images, we have 60,000 of. So we've got these many individual um, numbers in the array. 
Now, from there, I go ahead and do the same thing for X test, except this time 10,000 instead of 60,000. And of course, for both X train and X test, I divide by 255. And then after that, once I've got that NumPy array, I then go ahead and convert that to a tensor of type float. And I, uh, I use the NumPy initializer to convert from a NumPy array to a tensor. Now, from there, for the Y train and Y test, essentially all I need to do is go ahead and take my Y train and Y test NumPy arrays, reshape it to 60,000, 10,000, uh, give it the int32 type, tell it my depth is going to be 10, meaning 10 different categories, and then I run the one hot at indices initializer, pass it another tensor of type in 32, which is initialized with the NumPy initializer. And so essentially I take a NumPy array, convert that to a tensor of type in 32, and then convert that to a tensor of type float, which is one hot at indices. Now from there, I just go ahead and print out the shapes of all these different training arrays, just to sort of print it out for debugging purposes, figure out, you know, make sure that, they, that the data sets been loaded correctly. And then from there, I go ahead and actually define the real training and testing data set of type data set, which is a tensor pair of tensor float, tensor float, I initialize it from a tuple, which is X train, Y train, and then X test, Y test for the training data set and testing data set respectively. And so I go ahead and set these and now I've got my data set and just like that you've loaded a NumPy data set into Swift for TensorFlow. It's amazing how you can do this. Next up is the real sort of magic part of the code. This is the actual model that you're going to be using to train uh, and run inference. So I'm calling this MNIST model, and this is going to be a public structure. It's going to conform to the layer protocol, and this layer protocol is essentially going to let you have different differentiable attributes and weights that optimizers like stochastic gradient descent or Atom can actually optimize for you. Now in this case, I'm going to have C, uh, let's see, we're going to have one convolutional layer, another convolutional layer, a max pooling layer, another convolutional layer, and then two dense layers, and the final dense layer will give us our prediction. Now, after I've actually initialized all of these different, or, or once I've declared these different variables, then I can initialize and define exactly what they mean. So over here is the initializer for the class or for the structure actually. And I'm also taking this thing called a learning phase indicator. Now, if I were to, for example, include dropout or batch normalization, then these layers need to know if we're currently training or testing, if we're running inference or if we're currently training the neural network. And so the learning phase indicator will essentially tell those layers whether we're currently training or whether we're currently running inference. In this case, I'm not actually using the learning phase indicator. Now, from there, I go ahead and actually d d define these different layers. So first of all, I create a new Con2D layer. Now, Convolution2D is built into Swift for TensorFlow. I'm giving it a type of float, and the filter shape is going to be 33132. Why did I choose that filter shape? Well, in case you're not familiar with the actual raw TensorFlow operation, let's talk more about the actual Conv2D TensorFlow op. Essentially what it's gonna do is it's gonna take a filter, okay? This is going to be a filter of shape, filter width, filter, filter height. Then it's going to take the number of channels in and then channels out. And so essentially, let's just say we want a three by three filter size, we're taking in one channel and we wanna return 32 different channels. Then this is what our filter size would be. And of course, we're gonna want some padding. And in this case, we're just doing valid padding, which means no padding, just to essentially uh, run the convolution operation, do not add extra padding. Uh, and since we've got a three by three, oh, we jump to the top here. Since we've got a three by three filter filter size uh, on uh, on this on this uh, convolution operation, we're going to actually be going from a 28 by 28 image to a 26 by 26. So 3 minus 1 is 2, and 28 minus 2 is 26. So it's going to be a 26 by 26 by 32 image. 
Now, from there, what's going to happen, we're going to put one more of these layers, except this time it's going to take in 32 channels and out 64 channels, and it's going to reduce the dimensionality in terms of the actual size of the individual channels from 26 by 26 to 24 by 24. Then we're going to run some max pooling with a pool size of 2 by 2 and stride of 2 by 2, essentially halving the size of the image from 24 by 24 to 12 by 12. And then we run one last convolution operation with a 3 by 3 filter size once more, taking in 64 channels and out 64 once more with valid padding, reducing the dimensionality from 12 by 12 by 64 to 10 by 10 by 64. Then what I do is I add a dense layer of type float, and essentially it's going to take in a 10 by 10 by 64 length vector, output just 128, and then from there it's going to have the ReLU activation, rectified linear unit, essentially anything lower, the clip all values lower than zero. And then from there, I have one last dense layer, again of type float, with the input size of 128, which was the output size of the last layer, now an output size of 10, and an activation of softmax, so we get one hot encoded outputs, we get these logics from the softmax function. Then comes the real magic of Swift for TensorFlow. This over here. This is something that really makes your life working with deep learning a lot easier than you could possibly imagine. This is a differentiable attribute. Essentially what it's doing is that this, it's telling Swift that this applied function is differentiable with respect to self, which is the model, and the input passed into the applied function. So essentially, the applied function de to actually defines the forward pass of the neural network. So this is exactly how one forward pass is done using all the different layers or whatever else it is that you need to do. Then from there, in order to, for example, get your backward pass, the gradients of your forward pass, all you need to do is call the gradient function. But we'll talk about how that works in just a moment. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at how the applied function works. In essence, it's a sequence of taking one layer's output and feeding it into the next. So, for example, I take the input fed into this applied function and actually take the first convolution uh, layer and apply it to that input, run it through the rectified linear unit activation. Then, for the second convolution, I run it through, I actually apply it to the output of the last layer, run it through rectified linear unit, and then I take the pooling layer and apply it to the output of the last convolutional layer, etc, etc. I do the same thing for uh, convolution 3, and then I go ahead and flatten the output of that convolution. So for example, let's just say the output of this convolution is a matrix of size, um, let's just say our batch size in this case is uh, 64, um, and the output of the convolutional layer is 10, 10, 64, because we've got 64 channels. Now what's going to happen is from here, we're we're going to go ahead and actually take this vector and we're going to we're going to change it to a shape of 64 10 times 10 times 64. So in this case the result with the, of this would be 6400. So we're going to reshape it to 64 6400 and then we're going to feed this into the next dense layer because of course dense layers don't work in uh, in, in multiple dimensions they work in one dimension. Of course, that is unless you would have a time distributor wrapper like the one in Karas, but we won't get into that right now. All right, so now back to what I was saying. So this over here allows me to reshape that tensor uh, into essentially the batch size and then the number of elements uh, or the number of in, yeah, individual elements that I want uh, to it, want it to be flattened into. And then I just apply my first dense layer to that flattened output and then apply my second dense layer to the output of the last one. Again. In this case, I'm not actually defining which activation function to use here because I've already done that over here in my initializer. Conv2D does not support this activation in the initializer, uh, so I have to do that here, although, of course, that would be very convenient. All right, and just like that, you've got your applied function. And now, 
With just this much code, you have successfully conformed to the layer protocol. In fact, the only thing that you really need to put uh, to conform to layer um, would be this function. But I've actually added my own function over here called all weights. It's essentially just a convenience function to help me save all the weights from this model into a NumPy array. It returns an array of tensors. Uh, and so essentially, I just take the con1 filter, con1 bias, con2 et cetera, et cetera. I take all the weights and biases of all the layers, put that into an array, and return it. And just like that, I get all my weights. All right, so next up, once you've defined your model, and also one thing to note, this actually was a very simple model definition. In Keras, it would only take, say, you know, this much code to actually define the model, but the amount of flexibility and sort of inner workings that you're able to see with Swift for TensorFlow are great, and I'm sure that soon we're going to get even higher level neural network APIs, and when, of course, it's more of a final product, other people will start contributing and creating their own libraries to work with this as well. But for now, this is the highest level we can get with Swift for TensorFlow. All right, so next up, we've got one more function over here called the loss function. The loss function will return a softmax cross entropy loss, uh, which is a relatively complex loss. It's not sort of like a standard loss that you would use with, uh, with your average neural network. Um, and so this is actually also going to be a differentiable function with respect to the model that was fed into it. So into this loss function, I feed in an MNIST model, some images that I want to test the model against, and some labels of the actual true labels of those images. And I return a tensor. Now, this tensor is not an actual vector. It's not an array. It is a scalar value. It's just the actual individual loss value. So what I do is I go ahead and take the logits, the prediction of the model on the images, and then I go ahead and call a built-in function called softmax cross entropy on those logits and the labels that you provided into the function. After that, I've got just one more convenience function for myself called loss with accuracy, essentially where I go ahead and take a model, the images that you want to feed into the model, and the labels, and I return both the loss as just a float, a scalar, and an, accurate, and an accuracy value. So this is exactly why we actually got the SK Learn metrics package here. So what I do is I go ahead and predict the logits, then I go ahead and use NumPy to get the argmax and create the sparse logits and sparse labels. I go ahead and call softmax cross entropy the same way that I did last time, except this time I scalarize the value. And then from there I go ahead and calculate the accuracy using the accuracy score function of SK Learn, passing in the sparse labels and the sparse logits and converting that to a float and for unwrapping the optional. And so that's how I'm able to calculate loss and accuracy in the same function instead of calculating loss and then calculating accuracy and having to do two different model predictions. All right. Next up, let's define some hyperparameters. So over here, we've got our batch size. Now the batch size is in 32, it's a value of 64. Uh, essentially, this is gonna define how many individual batches of data uh, that we're gonna be using with our model. So let's just say in this case, of course, we've got a batch size of 64 and we've got 60,000 total images. So in that case, we have 938 total batches. So we have 937 batches that are full, you know, full of 64 individual images and then one extra batch at the end that doesn't have 64 that has 32 and it's not a full batch um, but in total we've got 938 different batches of course since we're starting off with an index of zero we'd be going from zero to 937 in our loop but that's a topic for another time since we actually don't mess with the actual indices or enumerating the training batches. But that actually brings me to how we batch the data. So I go ahead and define new two new constants, training batches and test batches. So I essentially take the training data set and the testing data set, and this is how simple it is to batch your data, by the way. I just call the batched function and pass my batch size. That's all. And just like that, I've got a data set that's been batched into however much uh, I want. In this case, 64. And so I've got, uh, let's see here again, 6,000 divided by 64. Uh, we've got 938 different batches. But of course, for testing, we would have 10,000 divided by 64, 157 different batches. 
All right, and so that was the training and test mini batching. Next up, let's actually go ahead and take a look at how we train the model. So of course, we should create a new learning phase indicator, we should create a new model, pass it the learning phase indicator, and then from there, create a new optimizer. In this case, I'm using stochastic gradient descent, I'm passing it my model, I'm telling it that I'm using the type float, and my learning rate in this case is 0.1, relatively high learning rate. Now from there, I go ahead and I actually loop through 1 to 10, uh, and I essentially have the epoch counter uh, and then I print out that we're training epoch whatever epoch we're currently on and then starts the sort of fun part uh, of Swift for TensorFlow this is sort of what allows the neural network to learn and this is our main training loop so first of all what I do is I declare a new variable called training loss sum which is a float equal to zero initially and the training batch count which is the total number of batches uh, that we have trained on so far now I'm telling the learning phase indicator that we are indeed currently training, and then I loop through each batch in the training batches. Then what I do is I create a new constant called gradients, and this is the really fun part. So I call the gradient function, I tell it to find gradient at model, and then I call another sort of function over here where it passes a model, and then this function returns a tensor float, which is the loss of that model. And the gradient function will go ahead and return the gradients of the model that the optimizer can use to optimize the weights. Now what I do inside of this function is I go ahead and calculate the current batch's loss uh, by calling the loss function. After that, I go ahead and actually add that loss as a scalarized value to the training loss sum that we declared over here, and then I return it as part of this little function over here. After that, I, uh, I increment the training batch count, and then I go ahead and update using the optimizer all the differentiable variables inside of my model, and I do it along the gradients that were turned from the gradient function. Again, this is the automatic differentiation that enables you to train neural networks in so much more of an easy way. Now, from there, I print out the average loss of the neural network in this sort of batch cycle, in this epoch, uh, by taking the total loss sum, and then, I and then I go ahead and divide it by the number of batches as a float. So we got a very accurate loss. Now from there, we can go ahead and actually test using the same code. So essentially, I tell a learning phase indicator that we are not training anymore. I go ahead and take the test loss sum, test accuracy sum in this case, because unlike training, I'm also calculating accuracy here. Of course, I also keep track of the testing batch count. And then I go ahead and loop through every batch in the test batches. I call the loss with accuracy function, add to the test loss and test accuracy sums, add to the test batch count and then print out the average loss and average accuracy by taking those sums and dividing it by the test batch count. And then after that, we're done. We've trained a neural network with Swift for TensorFlow, just like that. And now we're ready to export the model, download it to our local computer, and well, go ahead and use it however we like to. So in order to do that, what I do is I say weights, or W in this case, a new constant, is equal to model.allweights.map. Okay, so I get all the weights, which are an array of tensors, and then I map through them and convert each tensor to a NumPy array, or a Python object to be specific. Then I go ahead and take that specific tensor, convert that to a NumPy array, and then convert that, that new array of NumPy arrays into a NumPy array itself. And then I save that NumPy array to w.npy using the np.save function, and just like that, I've got my weights saved to my disk. And now I can go ahead and exit my code, and just like that, we should be ready to go ahead and actually use this code. Now, all I need to do is run swift main.swift, and it should go ahead, download the data, as you can see using wget, then it should go ahead and load it and print out the shapes, and then it should start with the first epoch any second now. It's gonna print out the loss and the accuracy for training and then validation, or the accuracy only for validation, and then it should go ahead and train for 10 epochs, and at the end, we should get a model that's around 97% accurate, but then again, every run is slightly different since we're not setting a random C. All right, so, so far, we are at 85% accuracy. Let's see how high we 
can get, but instead of having you watch paint dry, I'm gonna go ahead and speed up this clip of the video. But one more thing to show you. Now, if I were to click Control Z in order to sort of pause my, uh, my execution here, if I run NVIDIA SMI to take a look at what's happening, we are currently using around 1.5 gigabytes-ish of memory on the first Tesla P100 GPU. So we are using the GPU here. So if I click foreground to continue, prints out the average accuracy. Now we're getting to 87%. And I'm going to just quickly speed up this clip so you don't need to watch paint dry. All right, so as you can see towards the end, in this specific instance, we got around 89.4% accuracy, or rounded up because the next digit is higher than five, 89.5% accuracy. Now, of course, this is nowhere near state of the art. You can, of course, get a lot more optimized, uh, optimized uh, in terms of the model structure itself. But for now, let's go ahead and take a look if this model can perform as well as the one I'd shown you in the demo. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and copy the weight file that was just saved to the disk here over to my max disk. In order to do that, all I need to do is run this secure copy command with the correct directory in order to copy the weight file. So I'm going to go ahead and run this, give it my uh, server here. And just like that, it starts copying the weight file to my local disk. Now, right as that's done, we've got this new weight file over here. I can move it into the relevant directory. And now let's go ahead, go into it and start the Flask server. So over here, I have started my Flask server. Then what I can do is open up a new NGROK instance in order to actually be able to connect to that Flask server via my iPad and using my Swift code. So now let's head back over to the iPad to take a look at a demo of whether or not this model can perform as well as the last one we had just trained. So now let's see if this model can hold up with the model that we trained before. So let's go ahead and try, say, the number four. So if I go ahead and draw a four and click predict, indeed, it lets me know that I drew a four with 100% confidence. Maybe we can try something a bit more complex, like the number seven. I draw a regular old seven, tells me that I drew a seven, a little more complex, a different style, and it tells me that I still drew a seven regardless of the way it was shaped. We can try something like, for example, the number three. I click predict and it tells me that the number I drew was indeed a three. And then from there we could try, for example, nine. I draw a nine, it tells me that it's a nine, draw a six, and it tells me that I drew a six. And so that was a quick demo of the brand new model that we just trained in action, showing you that indeed it does perform quite well, of course, at around 90% confidence, it could get, or not even accuracy, it could get much better in terms of the actual structure of the neural network. We could use a different optimizer, like the Atom optimizer. We could train for more epochs and use a slower learning rate, tons of things we could do. But that was a quick demo of how you can use the brand new Swift for TensorFlow library in order to train your own neural networks on a GPU environment using CUDA 10 and CUDNN 7. All right, so I really do hope you enjoyed that demo in action. Again, if you'd like to use Google Collaborator instead of your own machine, feel free to do so. There'll be a link in the description describing exactly how you can do that. All right, so again, I really do hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, please make sure to leave a like down below. And apart from that, if you really do like my content and you want to see more of it, or if you do believe that this specific video could help anyone you know, like your family or friends, feel free to share the video with them. Leave a comment down below if you have any suggestions or feedback, and I'd love to get back to you. Apart from that, if you really do like my content, and you want to see more of it, please do consider to subscribe to my YouTube channel as well as it really does help out a lot. And apart from that, turn on notifications if you'd like to be, of course, notified whenever I release new content. So again, thank you very much for joining in today. That's what I have for this tutorial. Goodbye.